Uh, good morning. I'm Rich Colgard, the publisher of Forbes, and it uh, gives me great pleasure today to um, have a conversation with Teen Zoo of Zora, uh, a, a, which is in the subscription economy business, and we're going to learn more about that. The company is doing roughly about $200 million a year. Uh, they will be reporting their numbers uh, in a week or so, uh, and you'll get the, you might be able to get the official scoop on that. Uh, you were a multi-year veteran at Salesforce. I want to talk about the influence of Salesforce and being there uh, from 1999 um, uh, for several years and how that influenced your thinking sure. and your vision around the subscription economy. But uh, tell us what you mean by uh, the subscription economy and why it is such a lucrative place to be right now. Yeah. Um, so. If you boil down Salesforce, and you, you, I was one of the early employees there, I spent about nine years there, and Salesforce is coming on into its uh, 20th birthday, I think, uh, either this week or next week. Um, if you simplify Salesforce down, there were two models that we wanted to, 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 to invent to, to transform the software industry, right? And the first one we all know, it's, it's on the technology side. So there's a new technology model, this idea, I'm not going to ship the software to you on a CD. It's all on the cloud, right? It's all on demand, software as a service. But just as important as a new technology model was a new business model. That's always how we talked. And the new business model was a pay-as-you-go business model, that where if I'm not going to ship you the software and you're simply going to access my software over the internet, we should really be a subscription service. And that concept of saying, you know, people shouldn't buy software, they should simply subscribe, you, you know, because of Adobe, because of Microsoft, because of all these other companies, we're starting to take it for granted. But that was really, really transformational. And that just completely upended the entire industry. And so what we realized in 2007 was, you know, this whole thing about using a subscription-based business model to transform an industry, was that just a software phenomenon? or could it be applied to everything else? And so we looked at some of the earlier signs of, of, of services like Zipcar, because there's no Uber, there's no Lime you know, back then, but this idea that there's a whole, you know, there's millions of people that just said, oh, look, I'm not going to buy a car, they live in San Francisco, they live in New York, I'm just going to subscribe to the service and, and use the cars I need and, and simply pay, pay as you go. We looked at Netflix when they were still sending out DVDs, but there was about a million people at the time that said, look, I don't buy DVDs anymore. Right? I just go to Netflix, they send me what I want, and I just pay them 20 bucks a month. And we said, you know, maybe this can happen. Maybe this whole subscription business model can, 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 can ripple across all these other industries. And now in 2019, we're starting to talk about the end of ownership, where the idea of not owning things sounds a little kooky, but you can see it happen, right? You don't really need to own things if you can tap into a service to get what you want. That's really what we mean by the subscription economy. Well, it seems to me that it's also time generationally, at least in the consumer market, that, that uh, millennials and Gen Zs are really uh, buying into this idea of, of subscribing to things and not necessarily owning things. And, and uh, one of the big tests that may come up uh, in the next uh, few years will be automobiles. That's right. Uh, we're, we hear a lot about Bill Gurley at Benchmark Capital talks about peak car. We're in the era of peak car and yeah. Detroit doesn't know it yet. Maybe they're waking up to it. Yeah. I mean, so, in this kind of Nicholas Nigroponti delineation between the Adams economy and the bits economy, the bits economy is a natural for subscription services, but what you're saying is that we're moving more and more into the Adams yeah. economy. So you know, we're a software provider for companies that are launching or growing subscription businesses. Uh, so obviously our business, because we started the company in 2007, uh, has a lot of software companies. It has a lot of high-tech companies, right? But today, that's about only about 50% of our revenues. We actually work quite a bit with media companies, uh, like a New York Times, sorry, like a Wall Street Journal or a Financial Times. Um, but starting a few years ago, uh, we started seeing physical manufacturing companies really started working with us. And, and it's probably our fastest growing segment right now. And it could be anything from, 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 from cars to appliances to thermostats to, you know, to cameras. And, and, and it is the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things has really turned out to be a, a true phenomenon. And so we're talking to companies where, look, we have a million assets in the field, we have a thousand scanners in the field, we have a thousand printers in the field, and they're all collecting data, and they're all connected to the Internet. And what these companies are realizing is the same experience that, that software guys have, right, where, where, you know, if you grew up in the SaaS industry is one thing, but if you grew up in the software sector where you used to ship software, your first experience as a software as a service is mind-blowing because you actually can see what your customers are doing. I mean, I remember having that experience 
uh, in the early days of Salesforce. Now imagine every manufacturer of physical products having the same experience. I can see you know, how, how, how often people are driving my cars and how many miles they're driving. I can see how, how my tractors are being used. I can see how my printing presses are being used. I can see how my engines are being used. We're even talking to, to, to the non-electronic products, right? These desks and chairs and these furniture companies that sell office furniture saying, well, what if I can actually tell the facilities managers at these companies how often their desks and chairs are being used, right? Because there's a sense that, that office space is shifting, but I wish I had the data and the physical products can give me all that data. And, and, and that transformation is happening right now. So this is, this is no longer just a digital thing. Our whole physical universe is going to be transformed into a service as well. And uh, you mentioned, tra you work with Caterpillar? It's one of yeah. our customers, yeah. Yeah, Caterpillar. Well, t uh, talk about Caterpillar as an example of an old line company that's really been brought into the new artificial intelligence subscription economy Internet yeah. of Things world. Well, I mean, in the early days of the company, we, we used to try to think about um, what's the last industry right, that would go subscriptions. Is, is you know how far can we push this idea, and are there are there you know things that will never become a subscription? We used to talk about cement, and we used to talk about you know big industrial equipment, right? Caterpillar, and some of their equipment is is is, is probably like four times the size of this this tent right here. I mean, they're they're they're, they're gigantic. And then, so when Caterpillar said, hey, we, we want to talk to you, that was, that was really interesting. And, um, and they have two million physical assets in the field. And at the time, they had about 200,000, I think it's over a million now, of, and they're all connecting, collecting data. And for years and years, they would just dump the data into some cloud-based database, right? And, and no one would know what to do with it. But it got to the point where they're like, look, we can actually use this data to provide a better service. So they have a whole stack of applications. You know, there's, there's uh, predictive maintenance applications where my sensors are detecting vibration patterns, right, in, in, in these engines and actually know, look, we should service this thing now, right, versus, you know, wait for it to go down, then you got to wait for the, you know, the maintenance person, you got to wait for the part, it's two weeks. In the meantime, the company that's using this tractor is losing a lot of money. Uh, safety applications where, where you got an RFID badge uh, for all the people you know, working on site, on these construction sites, and, and, and these big machines know if somebody's behind it, it's backing up and it knows how to stop, right? And these things are all worth money. To uh, fully autonomous systems where, where you say, look, I got a piece of land, maybe it's a golf course, maybe it's a, it's a building complex, I need to sculpt it. And they send out the aerial drones to do the 3D mapping, right? They, they, they design all this stuff in the CAD, they beam all the instructions to these GPS-enabled precision ex excavators that can do a much better job than humans can. And, and so you see this world where like, okay, I don't have to buy the tractor, I could just pay for the outcome that I want, right? Which is, which is you know, I pay by the metric tons of dirt that I moved. Well, Clayton Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor um, who made us all aware of his theory of disruption with the innovator's dilemma back in the 90s, a, a constant phrase that occurs in his book is that people buy something from you whether it's a cup of coffee or um, a, an automobile, it's the job to be done. They're sure. buying, they're, they're employing that product uh, to do a job. Yeah. So this, this subscription economy really neatly fits into yeah. his overall theory that that's what people want. They want a job to be done. They're buying a job, of, they're buying the, the, the cup of coffee to be perked up. Um, or to get warm, or whatever, whatever it is, they're buying a job, not, so not we, yeah, a cup of coffee. We, we try to even broaden that. I mean, there's, there's, there's a service that you're trying to extract out of the product, right? W what, is, what is the part of the customer, and the customer could be a person or it could be a business, um, you know, life that, 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 that you fulfill? And, uh, and what is the outcome that they really want? And so it's not really about, you know, uh, movies or songs. It's really about entertainment, right? It's not really about the article, it's about understanding what's going on in the world, right? It's not really about software, it's about doing work. It's not really about the car, it's really about getting from point A to point B, right? And if you can service that part of their life or their, you know, their company's existence with a service and just take care of all, that's going to be better. And so like you know, the, the printing press example, and you just see it all the time. Uh, once the engineers can see how, how, how these physical products are, 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 are they're, they're lit up and they can see how they're being used, they immediately jump, you know, see that the customer is actually not using the product as well as we can, because right? we designed the thing, right? We designed these million-dollar printing presses, and and why don't we just run it for them, 
right? And uh, if we could just run it for them, then they're going to make more money, right? Because the more these, these machines are being used, the more revenue for them. And, and there's a bigger pie for everybody. And it just makes much more sense to do that. And then we'll improve it. We'll send out software patches, right? It's, it's much better for us to do it as a service than to give them a product and let them figure out you know, what, what to do with these things. When you're selling this to industrial, uh, the industrial world, uh, big things, big physical things, um, do people, what, what barriers do you have to overcome? Yeah. I mean, are they, uh, um, do, do they feel that they might be seeding the relationship with the customer to you? Um, or and th th thus be reduced to a commodity over time? Um, are they worried that maybe they'll cannibalize unit volumes? I mean, what, 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 what's, what are the conversations when you're talking yeah. to the industrial people? Absolutely, well, we are a software vendor, right? So we're a little bit more behind the scenes. So we, we would never um, disintermediate our customers, customers. But I think the broader point is, this really is a new business model. And, and when, I, when I think about what we did in the nine years at Salesforce, it was really about um, wiping the slate clean in terms of what it means to be a software company and then try to rebuild it from the ground up. And so uh, we started getting all these questions about, well, how do I do this transformation? And then the, you know, the reason we're here is we actually took our you know, 10 years of experience and, and, and put it into a book. And a book, you know, it's called Subscribed. Uh, but the first half of the book really touches on different industries, right? manufacturing, retail, tech, uh, news, you know, media, and, and talks about you know, how do we re-envision these industries if, if they're not really product-driven anymore, right? They're really driven by, by services. The manufacturing industry is, is so big and it's one of the more interesting things to, to, to think about. And the second half of the book is really, okay, now let's look inside your company and, and how do you change how you operate? And what are the lessons that we can draw from our experience of Salesforce to the experience of tech, but also see how these other industries are, are, are being transformed. So there's a chapter how the way to do innovation changes. If you can actually see what your customers are doing with your product, right? All the things about agile development for the software sector. We're, start, we're trying to talk to about countries like agile factories, right? How, 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 do we, how do we change the physical product? How do we make it more software driven so we can send updates to it much, kind of like what the Teslas are doing uh, today. Uh, we talk about how marketing changes, how sales changes, and even how the whole financial model of a company changes. So our favorite example in there is, is, is Netflix. And uh, people in, it's here in you know, Southern California, people are just complaining about how much money Netflix is willing to spend on, on shows. And they're saying it's kind of destroying the industry. But if you look at it from Netflix perspective, they're saying, I think they have 140 million subscribers now, but, but I think when we wrote the book, they had 100 million subscribers. And you multiply that by, call it $100 a year, all right, just to keep the numbers round. And then you realize they're generating $10 million of recurring revenue. And uh, you know, when they used to send out DVDs, right, they, 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 they raised the prices, and then I think a million people realized, like, I don't really use this thing, I should just cancel it. They've been raising prices right, as a streaming service, and no one cancels, because like, Netflix is like TV now. I mean, how do you live without it? And, and so they've got this solid $10 billion of recurring revenue, and they're saying, well, how do we spend it? Because it only, it only costs them, I think, about $2 billion you know, in Amazon fees and streaming fees and hosting fees. And so like, we got $8 billion of cash. And you can see that just the calculus is, okay, well, we got to spend some of it for new content to keep it fresh and keep people coming back, but let's go spend, you know, spend the other block of money on like, I don't know, kids content, sports content, you know, telenovas for Latin America, right? And that's how we're going to continue to expand. And so the whole financial model for these businesses are completely different. Something we realize at salesforce.com. And it's re reflected in their valuations too. It's reflected in their you, valuations, I think yeah. you wrote about uh, uh, Adobe, when Adobe went to a subscription model, from that point forward, Adobe's uh, market cap is quadrupled. That's right, and, and intuitively you would know that, right? Because if, if you came to me and said, look, I'll give you two deals. One deal is I'll give you $10. The second deal is I'll give you $10 a year for the next 10 years, right? Well, obviously the second one's worth more, but how do you reflect that in the traditional valuation structures and, and you can't, right? So the parts of the industries, like, like the software industry that's going into this area, Wall Street has a good understanding of, of but you're going to see that really ripple across all the other industries as well. Are there any, uh, so to, to go back to a question that you posed inside of Zora, are there any industries that you've discovered for which this doesn't work? Uh, so, so it's just a question of time. I mean, e even the cement example, years later, you know, later after we came up with that, we, we met a company that sells floors. And you know, being in Silicon Valley, I hear floors and I was like, okay, is this like another Docker, is it a container, right, is this some buzzwords? 
And then, you know, the, the, the accounting was like, no, no, they sell physical floors. They sell hardwood floors, tiles, cement. And it's like, well, that's interesting, right? Well, how, how do you subscribe to a floor? Well, first of all, like carpets are often industrial carpets. These are actually subscription services. That's why they often come in tiles, all right? Because there's somebody actually servicing these things. They rather service a tile than the whole thing. Uh, but but these, this company basically puts sensors underneath the floors and they create a smart floor. And, uh, and they're saying, well, what do we do with this smart floor now? And their minds are exploding with the possibilities. And so one of their first applications was, was in a hospital. So if somebody falls off the bed, you immediately know. Uh, they're collecting all this, it's a European company, they're collecting all this pedestrian traffic and selling it back to you know, governments right, to see where the pedestrians flow. Uh, they had to even think about you know, what to me was the obvious one in retail, right? You know, where, where, where's the foot traffic in a retail location? And, and so, but, but it was funny, they, they talk about like connected devices. The floor is the ultimate connected device because we're always connected to the floor because we're not birds. Uh, that's what the CEO said. And so, so when, when you hear these stories and you hear you know, what, what, what the corporate furniture companies are doing, um, you could just see, look, the, the world's gonna look very, very different in five years. Well, I mentioned Clayton Christensen. He's written uh, a book on education, higher education, and he's on record as saying, the half of the universities now in existence will not be here in some uh, fairly short period of time. Um, but you see more and more universities beginning to toy around this idea with, we'll send you, sell you a lifetime subscription yeah. um, so that you can get uh, refreshed. If you were educated as an engineer and you're, the half-life of your um, education is sh getting shorter all the time, which it is, you know, you can come back. Well, so once you start looking at these, these, these product versus customer, and the whole secret of this thing is, is, is think of it from the customer standpoint. Right? There's a diagram in the book. That's a diagram that gets sent around, especially in these traditional companies. And, and, and the traditional way that we think of business, and what you're taught in business school, is it's all about coming up with a hit product and selling as many units as possible. And even in the bits world, uh, you're still selling movie tickets. Right, professional services, you're still selling an hour of time. Right, everything's being forced down to a unit sale, and then you try to sell this unit in as many channels as possible. And that's, and if you, and whoever sells the most unit wins. And that's just how business has been done for the last 100 plus years. And, and the new world is saying, you know, start with the customer. And, and, and where is the customer, and what is our value proposition to the customer? And use digital technologies and physical technologies to kind of reinvent that customer experience and deliver the outcome that you want. So, so education is, is one of the few, when you look at it that way, education is one of the few industries that fires their customers every, you know, every two to four years, right? They just, you know, go away. But education should be a lifetime thing. We could just feel it, right? Things are changing so fast that education needs to be a lifetime experience. And, and, and the smart institutions are, 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 are moving towards that, right? Let's hold on to these people, right? And let's educate them over their lives. And, and it's a whole different way of thinking about the revenue model. There's a lot of discussion, uh, even at the political level, about, the, um, about trust uh, in this connected economy. Um, and how important is, well, of course you're going to say it's important, but talk about the value of, of trust if you're selling subscription model service, um, particularly in the enterprise where I think there's a higher uh, re a requirement for even for trust that's greater than th that exists in the consumer market. Uh, prob and many of the consumer tech companies have sort of already squandered or are squandering their, their trust and will find it impossible to make r inroads into the enterprise market. But how do you look at that? How do you look somebody in the eye you're selling them and yeah. th that you're not going to misuse their uh, data? So the subscription business model is really predicated on a relationship, right? Some people like to think of these as relationship businesses. It's not like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, at a book of the month club or, or where, where, where I just hope you don't cancel. I just keep sending you stuff, right? It's, um, they're, they're, you know, I need you to use a service. I need you to come back and use a service. You know, if, you, if there's high churn, then my business model doesn't quite work. And so there has to be trust in, in order to make that happen. So, um, so I know, I know Benioff's pretty, Mark Benioff, right, my, old, my old boss is pretty vocal about it these days, but, but, um, but we did have that at Salesforce. You know, we said, look, this data is not our data. Yes, we're a service, but the data is our customer's data. Our contracts are written out that way. If they leave, right, they get to take their data with them. And, um, and that should be the way it is, right? It, it, because you're using me as a service and you're paying me for the use of the service, 
But if you ever stop using it, you know, it's your data. You should, you should be able to take it back. I think what you see is, is like you said, in the enterprises, because it's the, the power relationship between vendor and customer, when the customer is a business, is a little bit more equal, right? Oftentimes, the businesses even have, have more power. I think what's happening is the power relationships between these services and the consumer is, uh, is not as equal. But that's, you know, that, that's the role of government. That's the role of regulation. But, but uh, we believe that there should be regulation so that the data that belongs to a customer clearly belongs to the customer. Well, uh, tell us what you learned about your Salesforce experience and particularly what CEO skills you, you picked up um, in your association with Benioff. The trick with Mark is to pick up the good skills and, uh, and not the bad ones, right? So, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, uh, I've been working at a place for nine years and, and working with Mark when he was still out of, uh, working, operating out of his house or the house next door to his house, technically. Um, it was an amazing experience and, and there's a lot that, 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 I, that I draw from. I think, you know, the book and talking about the subscription economy, it's probably a muscle we, I, I developed there, right? We used to try to talk about the bigger picture, not about, you know, the specific Salesforce automation tool that, 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 that we were building. And, um, and so a lot of that is really going to be, be, be brought into our company. Great. Quentin, did you have a question? Quentin Hardy is my old Forbes colleague, and then he was a tech reporter at the New York Times, then he, and he's the head editor at Google Cloud today, if you don't know Quentin. I just can't hold a job. <laughs> um, I think you put your finger on something really interesting that I'd like you to develop a bit, which is that this changes the customer relationship in really healthy ways, yeah. that you do have this data understanding of real-time usage, but you're awarding the power to the customer to own that data. That's right. Um, th those are two big potential areas. I mean, look, I, I drove the vertical efforts at Salesforce, and, and those were the two verticals that were the toughest to, uh, to, to get into. I, I think, um, intuitively, you can feel it, right? If, if, I, if I have all this data and I give it to a health service provider, they should be able to allow me to leave a much healthier lifestyle. Um, now, is that going to come out of the existing, um, you know, insurance-driven, medical system or is it going to come out of private sectors like Fitbits and things like that? That's unclear, right? Ultimately, it has to be in the broader system, but does the innovation really come from the private sectors that's, that has normal market forces, right, versus these abnormal market forces that, that are part and parcel of, of, of a healthcare system? And that just has to sort itself through, right? And you're seeing some things like, 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 like high-end concierge services. You're seeing one medical, right, try to move in this direction, but it's, uh, it's just slow. And then, you know, we, we saw some, you know, the, the, in the, the government sector, um, New South Wales was, was um, uh, putting a lot of thought into this, right? You know, how do I see my citizens as, as a subscriber to a set of services? And they're obviously paying for it, they're paying through taxes. And, and how do I have a single interface, right? And, and, and they were trying to redesign the whole system where if you're going fishing, you need five different permits. You got to go to five different agencies. And how do we build either in a call center environment, a physical, a store environment, or an online environment, one interface into, into all those things. There's huge potential there. Uh, in the U.S., you know, hopefully um, it comes out more in the local governments, hopefully, and, and hopefully those ideas will start to hit and start to spread. Uh, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware, talks about the four superpowers of technology, and it's the confluence of the superpowers, cloud, AI, edge computing, and and I think 5G, uh, maybe four, maybe five, but it, the confluence of all of these technologies that have really reached a critical mass of capability combined with, with a critical mass of users out there. When 5G becomes uh, um, common, for example, what will, what will happen then? How, how, how does all of your view of the world, I mean, seems to me that internet, internet of things really takes off with 5G. We really like this idea that these, 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 two, business, these two models, right? There's a new technology model and a new business model. And um, that is how, how telecom, you know, the teleco phone companies, right, uh, traditionally think. They have a infrastructure, uh, a network, right? You know, wires, towers, switches, 
and then they have a business model that allows them to tap into those resources. And it's a different way of thinking. It's more aligned to how you, know, you think of Uber as a network of cars, right, versus a manufacturing company that has an you know, assembly line shipping you physical products. And that is a, the two twin models. And so 5G, AI, right, this is all ripple effect that started you know, 30 years ago with, 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 with the internet, uh, you know, the World Wide Web, if you will. And, and it's just getting better and better, right? And there's more and more technologies. And every time the technology changes, there's, there's disruption. But the question for us is, is that's all great, and, you, and you, you know, there's digital disruption of how to use these technologies to reinvent your company, your industry, and how it operates. But then there's a business model shift that goes with that as well. And so the more these things happen, the more your business model is going to be pushed towards a, a, a service provider model. Right? I mean, AI is a great example. Is, is, is if I'm going to have AI get better and better and better, then that's going to lend itself to a service, right? Versus I send you a product, and it's a static product. It doesn't change. It doesn't get updated. You paid for it already. I'm not going to continue to invest in it, right? Because I'm off to the next version of the product, and I'm going to get you to upgrade or, or obsolete this product and buy the, my next version of the product. It's, 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 it's a broken model the more you want to tap into these type of technologies. Well, thank you very much for your time. This is really uh, eye-opening for me. Um, I recommend, uh, show, show them your book again. Um, if you're familiar with the book world, there are generally a couple kinds of uh, CEO books. There's kind of the vanity book, and then there's the substantive book. And you can often tell by who published it. And Penguin Portfolio is really a very esteemed publisher. This is a, is a substantive book, a readable book. Um, everything you heard today, you, you will get that and more in his book. So I encourage you to go out and, and get it. Thanks, Rich. Thank you very much. Thank you.